Good evening. My name is Tim Huang, and on behalf of the Harvard Speech and Parliamentary Debate Society, I'd like to welcome you all tonight to Israel and Palestine after this engagement. Where do we go from here? While we as an undergraduate group are usually involved with competitions around the world, we are particularly interested in promoting public debate and dialogue on campus. And tonight marks the first of many such events uh, planned for the Harvard community. Now, the support throughout the entirety of the university has been overwhelming. And uh, I'd like to take a moment to thank all our co-sponsors. These are the Harvard Students for Israel, the Palestinian Solidarity Committee, the Progressive Jewish Alliance, the Harvard Society of Arab Students, the Jewish Law Students Association, Justice for Palestine, Alliance for Israel, and in the Kennedy School of Government, the Arab, Jewish, and Muslim Caucuses, Students for Israel, Palestine Awareness Committee, and the Jewish Muslim Dialogue. <laughs> I'd um, also like to give special thanks to Bill White and the IOP Forum staff for their really, frankly, invaluable help in putting this project together for us. And uh, now I'll leave it to Brian to introduce the speakers tonight, but suffice it to say, you're about to witness a remarkable discussion uh, between really truly two of the most prominent thinkers in the ongoing discussion uh, for peace in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So without further ado, I am proud, very proud, to present this event tonight, and we hope you enjoy it. And uh, now it's my pleasure to turn the program over to tonight's moderator, Professor Brian Mandel. Uh, Professor Mandel is a lecturer at the JFK School of Government, and he directs the school's negotiations project. Brian? Thank you. Thanks, Tim, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. One of the missions of this school is to train public leaders to think hard about critical issues of the day. Certainly this evening, we are going to be addressing, confronting, and thinking hard about some of those issues as they relate to Israel and Palestine. Tonight, our critical issue is to bring it to point. Is Israel and Palestine after disengagement? Where do we go from here? As we know, both parties, Israelis and Palestinians, are shortly headed toward elections. In January for the Palestinians, probably in late March for the Israelis. Since the disengagement in August, both sides are wrestling mightily with their internal constituents, some on board for peace, some reluctant, some not so anxious at all to proceed with what is still an unknown and uncertain future. But there is a ray of hope, if you've read the papers in the past couple days, an Israeli-Palestinian peace soccer team, a joint team, has showed up in Spain. What's interesting about this is that beneath the rhetoric, beneath the politics, there is a level of humanity in both suffering and hope that these two peoples will soon join hands and produce a better and a different path. And tonight, I think we're here to discuss what that path might look like. What I want to uh, do before uh, introducing our two speakers is to make clear what our format is for this discussion. First, each speaker will make a 10-minute opening statement on the topic. Then for approximately 45 minutes or so, I will moderate a question and answer session from you, the audience. We will conclude with two minute closing statements from each speaker. And while I encourage you to ask any question you deem appropriate to Professors Chomsky and Dershowitz, and I include in that tough questions, I also ask for the sake of the audience that you be brief and respect the right of each speaker to respond as well. Please remember that civility is the cornerstone of our democracy and certainly a hallmark here at the forum. Born in Brooklyn, Professor Alan Dershowitz graduated from Brooklyn College and Yale Law School. At Yale, he graduated first in his class and served as editor-in-chief of the Yale Law Review. 
After clerking for Chief Judge David Braslin and Justice Arthur Goldberg, he was appointed to the Harvard Law faculty at age 25. There wasn't even time for you to join a mid-career program here at the school. And he became a full professor at 28, the youngest in the school's history. When not teaching students, he found time to be one of the country's uh, most accomplished defense lawyers and authored over 20 books. His latest, The Case for Peace, How the Arab-Israeli Conflict Can Be Solved, has received favorable reviews from former President Bill Clinton and Middle East negotiator Dennis Ross. At Harvard Law School, where he is the Felix Frankfurter Professor of Law, Professor Dershowitz teaches courses in criminal law, constitutional litigation, civil liberties, and violence, legal ethics, and human rights. Professor Noam Chomsky, son of a Hebrew scholar, Professor Chomsky was born in Philadelphia. While he acquired his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in 1955, much of his research leading to his degree was done here at Harvard between 1951 and 1955. In 1955, he joined MIT and in 61 was appointed full professor in the Department of Modern Languages and Linguistics. From his articulate opposition to the Vietnam War in the mid-60s, to his book Manufacturing Consent in 1988, and to his even more challenging text, 9-11, published after the terrorist attack that year, Noam Chomsky has never retreated from taking on the most pressing issues of our day. Professor Chomsky is the Institute Professor of Linguistics at MIT and teaches classes in linguistic theory, syntax, semantics, and the philosophy of language. Before we begin, and to set the appropriate tone and context for this evening, I'd like us to have a brief look uh, at a short clip from a forum event last year. Hi, my name is Laura Daggy. I'm a junior in the college. And I was wondering, as a leader who is internationally recognized in the struggle for peace, what advice do you have for the rising leaders of our generation? First of all, don't be, don't be like us. <laughs> be different. You know, personally, I have very little patience for history. I believe that to imagine is more important than to remember. Let me just repeat that so that we have that as the tone and the context for our discussion tonight. And I quote from Shimon Peres, first of all, don't be like us, be different. Personally, I have very little patience for history. I believe that to imagine is more important to remember. So tonight, let us imagine what should be the next steps in the process of achieving peace in the Middle East. For your knowledge, a coin toss conducted by the Harvard Speech and Parliamentary Debate Society has determined that Professor Dershowitz will speak first for 10 minutes. After that, we will go to directly to Professor Chomsky, and then the floor will be open. Professor Dershowitz. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's a great honor for me to be participating in a debate with a man who has been called the world's top public intellectual. My connections to Noam Chomsky go back a long time. In the 1940s, I was a camper and he a counselor in a Hebrew-speaking Zionist camp in the Pocono Mountains called Camp <laughs> Massad. In the 1960s, we both worked against the Vietnam War. In the 1970s, we had the first of our many debates about the Arab-Israeli conflict. I advocated uh, ending the Israeli occupation in exchange for peace and recognition of Israel. He advocated a one-state solution modeled on Lebanon and Yugoslavia. We debated again in the 1980s and the 1990s. <laughs> I have the text. <laughs> I hope that our once a decade encounter will continue for many decades to come, though I doubt we will agree with each other. The debate today occurs at a time of real potential for peace. Shimon Perez, Israel's elder statesman in the peace camp, today quit the Labor Party and announced his support for Ariel Sharon in the upcoming election. Quote, 
In my eyes, it is not a problem of parties, but a problem of peace, how to create a strong coalition for peace. The elements are now in place for a real peace. As I wrote in the case for peace, when the Palestinian leadership wants a Palestinian state, more than it wants to see the destruction of Israel, there will finally be a two-state solution. The untimely death of Yasser Arafat makes the two-state solution a real possibility. I call Arafat's death untimely because if it had occurred five years earlier, we might now be celebrating the anniversary of Palestinian statehood. Arafat's decision to turn down the Clinton-Barak plan for Palestinian statehood was characterized by Prince Bandar of Saudi Arabia as, quote, a crime against the Palestinians, in fact, against the entire region. The crime and the death that it needlessly caused can never be undone. But this is a time to move forward and to assure that the crime is not repeated. The time has come for compromise. My friend Amos Oz, the great novelist and leader of the Israeli peace movement, has said there are two possible resolutions to a conflict of this kind, the Shakespearean and the Chekhovian. In a Shakespeare drama, every right is wronged, every act is revenged, every injustice is made right, and perfect justice is prevailed, prevails, but at the end of the play, everybody lies dead on the stage. In a Chekhov play, everybody's disillusioned, embittered, heartbroken, and disappointed, but they remain alive. We need a Chekhovian resolution for the Arab-Israeli tragedy. This will require the elevation of pragmatism over ideology. It will require that both sides give up rights. Rights, giving up rights is a hard thing to do. It will require that each side recognizes and acknowledges the pain and the suffering of the other and it will require an end to the hateful attitudes and speech that some on each side direct against the other. Sometimes it's better to start at the end. The ultimate solution is not as much in dispute these days as is the means for getting there. I believe that even Professor Chomsky and I have the same basic agreement about a number of very important elements of what a pragmatic resolution might look like. Professor Chomsky now acknowledges that the two-state solution may be, quote, the best of the rotten ideas around. I'll settle for that. He also seems to acknowledge that those who advocate the so-called Palestinian right of return are pandering to their people and misleading them into believing that there is yet another weapon, a demographic weapon, that can destroy Israel. I think we both agree that Jerusalem should be divided essentially along demographic lines with the Palestinians controlling the Palestinian population and Israel controlling the Jewish population, that the borders between Israel and the Palestinian state should be based roughly on the UN Resolution 242, that Israel properly ended its occupation of the Gaza and that it should end its occupation of all Palestinian cities and population centers on the West Bank, that terrorism must stop and that the Palestinian state that results from this peace must be as contiguous as possible and economically and politically viable. There remain considerable differences between us and more importantly between the Israeli government and the Palestinian Authority that must resolve these issues and actually sit down and make peace. Some of these differences are attitudinal. I believe that peace is a realistic possibility whereas Professor Chomsky apparently believes there is no chance for peace, at least as reflected by the German title of his new book, Keiner Schanz für Frieden, which translates as no chance for peace, why a Palestinian state is not possible to be established with Israel and the United States. I hope you're wrong. Other differences are quite specific, Relating to precise boundaries and considerations that are quite important, the devil always being in the details. I strongly believe, however, that there is a genuine will for peace on both sides now and that the pragmatic differences can and will be resolved. And here I think the academy can play a very important and positive role in fostering peace. At the moment, I'm sad to report that many academics around the world are contributing to an atmosphere that makes peace more difficult to achieve. They are encouraging those Palestinians who see the end of Israel as their ultimate goal to persist 
in their ideological and terrorist campaign by demonizing and delegitimating Israel in the international community and on university campuses throughout the world, they send a doubly destructive message to those who must make peace on the ground. To the Palestinians, the message is don't compromise. If you hold out long enough, the next generation of leaders will buy into your efforts to delegitimate Israel and will give you the total victory you seek. To the Israelis, the message is whatever you do in the name of compromise, you will continue to be attacked, demonized, divested from, boycotted, and delegitimated, so why make the compromise efforts? As I travel around college campuses in the United States, I notice a stark difference. Many of those who support the Palestinian cause tend to be virulently opposed to Israel, comparing the Jewish state to Nazism and apartheid, comparing Shimon Peres to Hitler and Idi Amin, calling Israel the world's worst human rights violators, and suggesting that Israel should be flattered by a comparison with the Gestapo. These are all quotes, the Amin Hitler quote from Professor Chomsky, the comparison with Gestapo from Norman Finkelstein. Whereas most of those on the Israeli side tend to be supportive of a peaceful Palestinian state. Put another way, pro-Palestinians tend to be anti-Israel, whereas pro-Israelis are often pro-Palestinian as well. It was not the Israelis who scuttled the United Nations two-state solution in 1948 and themselves originally occupied Gaza and the West Bank with little or no objection from the international community. That was Egypt and Jordan. It was not the Israelis who turned down Resolution 242 in 1967 with the famous three no's, no negotiation, no peace, and no recognition. As Abba Ibn put it, this is the first time in history that the side who won the war sued for peace and the side that lost the war demanded unconditional surrender. It was not Israel that turned down the generous offer at Camp David and Taba. The Palestinian leadership has never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity, but it is not too late for peace now. I wish to end my opening remarks today by making a specific proposal directed to my distinguished opponent. I propose here today a peace treaty among academics who purport to favor peace between Israel and the Palestinians. I believe that by agreeing to this peace treaty and by implementing it, academics can actually contribute to encouraging a pragmatic peace. I call today for those who have supported the Palestinian cause to stop demonizing Israel, to stop delegitimating Israel, to stop defaming Israel, to stop applying a double standard to Israel, to stop divestiture and boycotts of Israel, and most importantly, to stop being more Palestinian than the Palestinians themselves. I call on academics who support Israel not to call for a greater Israel, nor to call for a continuation of the occupation of Palestinian cities, to stop being more Israeli than the Israelis themselves, and to join the vast majority of Israeli and American supporters of Israel who favor the two-state solution. If the two elder statesmen of Israel, Sharon and Perez, can place pragmatism before ideology and peace before party and come together toward the center in the interest of a pra pragmatic peace, then surely two elder statesmen of the American academic debate over Israel who share this platform tonight can also make our contribution to the peace process by encouraging those who respect us and sometimes follow our guidance to move closer to the center and closer to accepting a pragmatic, non-ideological resolution of this bitter conflict. Ecclesiastes many years ago said, to everything there is a season, a time to throw stones, a time to gather stones, a time for war and a time for peace. This is the season of peace. Let us not let it pass us by. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Dershowitz, Professor Chomsky. Uh, Mr. Mandel will confirm uh, there was an explicit condition for this debate. Uh, that is that neither participant tried to evade the issue by deceitful allegations about the other. So I therefore congratulate Mr. Dershowitz on having made a true statement. I was a counselor at Mossad. About the rest, uh, there happens to be an ample record in print 
uh, or if you like, you can ask a question, but I'll keep to the topic and the rules. Uh, the topic is, where do we go from here? Uh, the answer to that is largely up to us. Uh, evidently, it requires some understanding of how we got here. Uh, the question of where we're going now uh, has a clear answer. Uh, it's given accurately by the leading academic specialist on the occupation, uh, Harvard's Sarah Roy. Uh, she writes that under the terms of disengagement, Gazans are virtually sealed within the Strip, while West Bankers, their lands dismembered by relentless Israeli settlement, will continue to be penned into fragmented geographic spaces, isolated behind and between walls and barriers. Uh, her judgment is affirmed by Israel's leading specialist on the West Bank, uh, Meron Benvenisti, uh, who writes that the separation wall snaking through the West Bank will create three Bantu stands, his words, north, central, and south, all virtually separated from East Jerusalem, the center of Palestinian commercial, cultural, and political life. And he adds that uh, this, what he calls the soft transfer from Jerusalem, that is an unavoidable result of the separation wall, might achieve its goal. Quoting still, the goal of disintegration of the Palestinian community after many earlier attempts have failed. The human disaster being planned, he continues, will turn hundreds of thousands of people into a sullen community, hostile and nurturing a desire for revenge. It's another example of the sacrifice of security to expansion that's been going on for a long time. A European Union report concludes that US-backed Israeli programs will virtually end the prospects for a viable Palestinian state by the cantonization and by breaking the organic links between East Jerusalem and the West Bank. Uh, Human Rights Watch in a recent statement concurs. There was no effort to conceal the fact that Gaza disengagement was in reality West Bank expansion. Uh, the official plan for disengagement stated that Israel will permanently take over major population centers, cities, towns and villages, security areas, and other places of special interest to Israel in the West Bank. Now, that was endorsed by the U.S. ambassador, as it had been by the president, breaking sharply with U.S. policy. Uh, along with the disengagement plan, Israel announced investment of tens of millions of dollars in West Bank settlements. Prime Minister Sharon immediately approved new housing units in the town of Ma'ala Adumim, to the east of Jerusalem, the core of the salient that divides the southern from the central Bantustan, to use Benvenisti's term, and also announced other expansion plans. Uh, there is near unanimity that all of this violates international law. The consensus was expressed by U.S. Judge Bergenthal in his separate declaration attached to the World Court Judgment, ruling that the separation wall is illegal. In Bergenthal's words, the Fourth Geneva Convention and international human rights law are applicable to the occupied Palestinian territory and must therefore be fully complied with by Israel. Accordingly, the segments of the wall being built by Israel to protect the settlements are ipso facto in violation of international humanitarian law, uh, which uh, happens to mean about 80% of the wall. Two months later, Israel's high court rejected that judgment, ruling that the separation wall, quoting, must take into account the need to provide security for Israelis living in the West Bank, including their property rights. Uh, this is consistent with Chief Justice Barak's doctrine that Israeli law supersedes international law, particularly in East Jerusalem, annexed in violation of Security Council orders. And practically speaking, he's correct, as long as the United States continues to provide the required economic, military, and diplomatic support, as it has been doing for 30 years in violation of the uh, international consensus on a two-state settlement. Uh, you can find detailed documentation about all of this in work of mine and others 
who have supported the international consensus for 30 years in print, explicitly. In Israeli literature, like Benny Morris's histories, uh, you can find ample evidence about the nature of the occupation. In Morris's words, founded on brute force, repression and fear, collaboration and treachery, beatings and torture chambers and daily intimidation, humiliation and manipulation, along with stealing of valuable land and resources. Uh, like other Israeli political and legal commentators, Morris reserves special criticism for the Supreme Court, whose record, he writes, will surely go down as a dark day in the annals of Israel's judicial system. Uh, keeping to the diplomatic record, the first uh, both sides, of course, rejected 242. The first important step forward was in 1971, when President Sadat of Egypt offered a full peace treaty to Israel in return for Israeli withdrawal from the occupied territories. Uh, that would have ended the international conflict. Israel rejected the offer, uh, choosing expansion over security. In this case, expansion into the Egyptian Sinai, where General Sharon's forces had driven thousands of farmers into the desert to clear the land for the old Jewish city of Yamit. The U.S. backed Israel's stand. Uh, those decisions led to the 1973 war, a near disaster for Israel. Uh, the U.S. and Israel then recognized that Egypt could not be dismissed and finally accepted Sadat's 1971 offer at Camp David in 1979. Uh, but by then, the agreement included the demand for a Palestinian state, which had reached the international agenda. Uh, in 1976, the major Arab states in introduced a resolution to the UN Security Council calling for a peace settlement on the international border based on UN 242. Uh, but now adding a Palestinian state in the occupied territories, that's Syria, Egypt, Jordan, and every other relevant state. Uh, the U.S. vetoed the resolution again in 1980. The General Assembly passed similar resolutions year after year with the United States and Israel opposed. The matter reached ahead in 1988 when the PLO moved from tacit approval to formal acceptance of the two-state consensus. Israel responded with a declaration that there can be no, as they put it, additional Palestinian state between uh, Jordan and the sea, Jordan already being a Palestinian state, that's Shimon Peres and Yitzhak Shamir, and uh, also that the status of the territories must be settled according to Israeli guidelines. Uh, the U.S. endorsed Israel's stand. Uh, I can only add what I wrote at the time. It's as if someone were to argue that Jews don't need a second homeland in Israel because they already have New York. In May 1997, for the first time, Paris's Labor Party agreed not to rule out the establishment of a Palestinian state with limited sovereignty in areas excluding major Jewish settlement blocks, that is, the three cantons that were being constructed with U.S. support. The highest rate of post-Oslo settlement was in 2000, the final year of Clinton's term and Prime Minister Barak's. Uh, maps of the U.S.-Israel proposals at Camp David show a salient east of Jerusalem bisecting the West Bank and a northern salient virtually dividing the northern from the central canton. I have the maps if you want them. The current map considerably extends these salients and the isolation of East Jerusalem. A the, my maps are from the leading Israeli scholars, Ron Kundak, the director of the Shimon Peres Center. The crucial issue at Camp David was territorial, not the refugee issue for which Arafat agreed to a pragmatic solution as Kundak, the leading scholar, reveals. Uh, no Palestinian could accept the cantonization, including the U.S. favorite, Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, Clinton, we don't have to debate it, because Clinton recognized that Palestinian objections had validity, and in December 2000 proposed his parameters, which went some way toward satisfying Palestinian rights. Uh, in Clinton's words, 
Barak and Arafat, Arafat had both accepted these parameters as the basis for further effort. Both have expressed some reservations. The reservations were addressed at a high-level meeting in Taba, which made considerable progress and might have led to a settlement, uh, but Israel called them off. That one week at Taba is the only break in 30 years of U.S.-Israeli rejectionism. High-level informal negotiations continued, leading to the Geneva Accord of December 2002, welcomed by virtually the entire world, rejected by Israel, dismissed by Washington. That could have been the basis for a just peace. It still can. Uh, by, by then, however, Bush-Sharon bulldozers were demolishing any base.